Good evening. My name is Don Ficken. I'm a member of the Library Telescope Task Force. We've been working for the last several years to promote the Library Telescope program to grow it and share best practices. We've been doing monthly uh, uh, seminars uh, once each month, workshops, if you will. And we're, we're happy once again to bring you a program. Tonight's program will be uh, binocular observing in winter skies. That's a very exciting topic. Uh, I know a lot of us want to get outside right now and just enjoy the night sky. Rocky Togney from the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society will be leading our program. Um, if you haven't checked out our website lately, our group is continuing to grow. We have a, actually an international map, believe it or not. If you go to our website at librarytelescope.org, you'll see that you can click on, uh, let's say, Canada or the U.S. or the Netherlands or the, or the United Kingdom. Yeah. And you'll be able to, uh, to literally look at like locations and within the US and Canada, particularly, you can actually click on a province or a state and see locations. And these are just the locations we know about. We are sure there's probably a lot more locations. So if you know of some of the locations that are not listed, please let us know. So tonight's program will be uh, binocular viewing in winter skies. Uh, next month's program, uh, we, we kind of shake it up every once in a while. Next month, we'll be working on is uh, sharing with this specific library. We'll learn a little bit about their experiences of starting a program. So whether you're a library or astronomy club, you'll hear some uh, some really inside views of how, how they really got started, how really they worked it, how they were able to finance, promote it. You'll be able to ask some great questions. Now, all the, the particular events that we have, like tonight, we record those and we put them onto our YouTube account. If you go to librarytelescope.org and click on the very top right, you'll see a YouTube button. You can click on that. And by the way, I have with me tonight Tom Lynch. He's uh, with the Amateur Observer Society of New York. He runs our Facebook page. He does a tremendous job. So I really encourage you to go to facebook.com uh, forward slash library telescope. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Of course, we're live streaming on that tonight. So we will be holding questions to the end. If you have a question and you're on Zoom, if you can put it in the Q&A box, we'll pick it up at the end. If you're on Facebook, just go ahead and put it in the comments area. We'll be monitoring those questions and we'll get done. We're supposed to take about roughly 20 minutes or so. We'll have questions at the end. We'll try to do the best we can and uh, answer your questions. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Rocky, if you can bring up your screen share and we'll get going here. Looking forward to it, Rocky. Okay. Okay, my, my first, I'm going to have two parts of the program. The first part will be about choosing binoculars, uh, your first pair of binoculars. And uh, the second part will be uh, the winter skies, how to use your binoculars in the winter skies. Um, down through the years, I've uh, been an astronomer for a long time or amateur. And people say, what kind of telescope do you, do, should I get? And Invariably, I say the first thing you need to do is get you a pair of binoculars and learn the skies. Uh, you can, it can get very frustrating with a telescope when uh, when you can't find what you want to look for. But anyway, uh, so that's usually the first thing we say. And um, there we go. So why start with with binoculars instead of a telescope? First of all, the image is right side up. In a telescope, it is. Uh, uh, it's inverted or it's backwards. So it's kind of confusing, but uh, it's not too bad once you get used to it. It's much less expensive than a telescope, easier to learn to use than a telescope. Uh, it's really good for wide field views of the Milky Way, the moon, and, uh, and a lot of bright, deep, brighter deep sky objects. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those tonight. Uh, you can just walk out your door and your equipment is all set up. You don't have to set up a lot of equipment. Uh, you can go, you know, and I used to, uh, when I was studying to learn learn the sky, I would, uh, or, or maybe find deep sky objects, I might go in and, and, and look at charts and stuff and then go out and, and try to find it. I'd, I'd try to use a red light, but at least it was warm inside. So, uh, so you got a lot more versatility with binoculars. After you graduate to a telescope, you'll still use your binoculars. I, I, I use a telescope a lot. And a lot of times I, when I'm trying to find something, I'll, I'll use binoculars or I want to look at something with binoculars. And when you go from naked eye to binoculars, uh, it's the same impact as going from binoculars to telescope. So 
just going to binoculars will will greatly expand your your enjoyment of the night sky and after all binoculars are just two refracting telescopes with objectives eyepieces uh prisms for inverting the image uh and, and even telescopes sometimes if you're uh working with a refractor telescope you'll have prisms so basically it's just like a telescope it's just got extra prisms to make sure your image is is uh is upright like for for land views you definitely have to have upright images uh first thing you want to do is figure out which pair what kind of binoculars uh you want to get and the way bin binoculars are configured is is uh, like a seven by 50 pair of binoculars means that you have seven power and 50 millimeter objective lenses so the 50 millimeters is the light gathering how much light it gathers and the seven seven is the is the power uh and most of your and binoculars will always have a, a plate like this or somewhere a lot of times they're in the center but it'll say seven by 50 and we'll talk about field of view in a minute and, and some other information um okay Field of view is uh, is an important with binoculars because you want to see as wide an area of the sky as you can, and a lot of times cheap binoculars will have a, a lot narrower field of view. So if you're buying binoculars, you'll want to uh, look at the field of view of the binoculars, uh, and it's expressed in linear feet at a thousand yards, uh, four and thirty feet, four and seventy feet, seventy eight feet. This is a uh 315 feet <clears throat> so but if you get to higher power binoculars like 10 power they'll have uh lower degrees uh, lower feet so that's something else to consider so so don't try comparing a pair of 8 by 42s with a pair of 10 by 50s uh that, that's not a fair comparison figure out which which size you want first and then look at look at the uh, others with the same field of view so that's one thing to consider another thing is your exit pupil and exit pupil is determined by deter by dividing uh it, like for a 7 by 35 35 divided by 7 would be a 5 millimeter exit pupil and that's important uh with age because it, as you age your exit pupil shrinks if you uh if you have a uh a uh, really wide exit pupil like with 7 by 50s you have a 7.1 millimeter exit pupil and you only have a five mil your eye only has a five millimeter pupil for the light to enter into then you're losing a lot of light there you'd be better off with a pair of 8 by 42s or, or a, a 10 by 50s uh, which would have a five millimeter exit pupil so you need to kind of match that so uh and the way it goes is as a young adult you've got about a 7.5 millimeter ex pupil when you're between 30 35 to 40 or something like that it, it has shrunk to about 6.5 millimeters 50 to 60 about 5 50 millimeters and all the way to 5 millimeters by age 80. so um you want your uh uh exit pupil to be about the about you know close to that size to get the most out of your binoculars i use i started out using seven by 50s when i was younger but now uh uh mostly it for wide field viewing i'll use eight by 42s because that that just seems so much better to me than seven by 50 and i'm sure that's because i've aged eye relief is important because um that what that is is that's the distance where the where the image focuses and where your eye would be so if you wear if you wear eyeglasses uh your eye is going to be back behind this uh and uh and so if you've got a short a short eye relief then and you wear eyeglasses then it might not, not work for you very well um it's uh typically typically 10 to 20 millimeters what they suggest is to try to get something around 16 millimeters and i wanted to show one thing here and i don't know i may have to stop stop share how do i do oh 
just share my bit, my camera here. Well, anyway, uh, anyway, the, the newer binoculars have a twist, twist up cup that rolls up and down for eyeglasses. And it, it's really a nice feature compared to the old uh, rubber eye cups. So most modern binoculars have that twist up feature, which, which is good for both eye, eyeglass wearers and non-eyeglass wearers. There's two types of binoculars, a roof prism and a poral prism. And the poral prism is the old kind that you, I'm sure you recognize, the uh, typical binocular. And um, so they have uh, uh, prisms that, uh, that space out the objective lenses. And there's some advantages to it and, dis and disadvantages. The roof prisms are, are straight through. Uh, I think the next slide has. So here's the disadvantages and advantages. The roof prisms are, a lot of hunters really like the roof prisms. They're smaller and lighter than, uh, than the, the poor old prisms. Uh, their beam is, is split and less, but, but the beam is split and less light is transmitted. You have more light through, uh, a little bit more light through poor old prisms for the same binoculars. Uh, and they're more expensive than equal quality poro. Uh, poro are best for astronomy. Uh, they're less expensive, more light transmitted. Uh, the wider objectives give you more contrast. A disadvantage is they're easier to knock out of alignment than the uh, than the roof prisms, and we'll have a little more on them in a minute. Uh, focusing with binoculars, uh, the way you focus is uh, look through both sides, and and with your left and with your left eye, you focus your left eye first while you're adjusting this. This is most some binoculars you have to adjust both eyepieces. But most binoculars, the smaller binoculars anyway, that, that we're talking about, you have a center adjustment that, that adjusts both of them back and forth. And then on the right, you have a, a, you can twist this and adjust this individually. So if your eyes are a little bit different, first you set your left eye and then you, you twist this one thing to adjust your right eye and, and your left eye is still the same place. So now you're, uh, you're good for uh, any distance. As long as you, you're using your binoculars, uh, you, can, you can change your distance. You know, go from looking at a bird 10 feet away to the stars and you'll be in focus for both of them. If you get to be more than, more than 10X, you really need uh, something to uh, uh, stabilize your binoculars because they just wobble too much. Uh, you can't hold them still enough. And, you know, you can lay on the ground and, and rest them against your eyes. I've done that sometimes. Use a recliner and rest them uh, on your eyes. There's tripod mounts. Tripod mounts are difficult because you have to kind of get under them. Uh, this kind of mount here uh, is, a is a good binocular mount where you can actually get under it and look up. I've used a monopod mount a lot um, in a chair and just lean back in the chair and, and stabilize the monopod. Uh, but they, they work, but you do need something if, if you get to be more than 10X. Uh, astronomy recommendations for the binoculars. First thing is to determine your size and power. Next is to, um, <clears throat> is to figure out whether you want poro prism or roof prism, and both are good for, for astronomy. Uh, it's just, uh, you got, you got, if you're going to do bird watching too, you definitely, you probably want roof prism because uh, because uh, they have a lot closer focus and they're a little bit smaller to carry out in the field. You don't want a uh, ruby colored coating like on these glasses down here. Uh, you want, but you do want your, all your lenses to be multi-coated. Uh, eye relief at least 16 millimeters. And we talked about the eye cups. Uh, check your field of view. And you definitely want them to be waterproof or at least water resistant. Th other things to consider are to match your exit pupil to your age. So if you're young, a 7 by 50 might be the pair you want to start with. If you're a little bit older, 8 by 42 is a, is a great, great size. 8 by 42 is good for anybody, really. Um, if, you, if you're going to be looking at birds and butterflies, you want to look at the uh, focal distance, focus distance, how close it will focus. What you do, you definitely want to avoid some of the uh, uh, 
binoculars, like pre-focus binoculars where you don't have to focus them, zoom binoculars, and uh, uh, binoculars that have the anti-reflection coatings. So here's just a chart of comparing binoculars. And if you, when you figure out what size you want, you'll probably want to do a chart like this. And you, and you can see all of them are multi-coated. Some of them are waterproof and some, and some aren't. Here's your fields of fields of view. Here's your close focus. So, so you can see the one, you give up a little field of view, but you get a, a really close focus with the vector, cross, vector crossfire. Uh, good eye relief on all of them, but one. And here's your weight and here's your prices. So, so you'll want to put together a little chart like this maybe when you uh, decide to get a pair. And I'd recommend eight by 42 or seven by 50 for your first pair. Some other good sizes are seven by 35 and 10 by 50. Uh, and then, you know, I've got uh, six or seven different, different sizes of binoculars. So you can have too many like me, but um, uh, they're a lot of fun and I really enjoy them. The St. Louis Astronomy Clubs have partnered with the Audubon Society. And this is a, a good program where you've got library telescopes to put uh, binoculars in, in with them. And uh, the, what they settled on is eight by 42 roof prism vector crossfire. <clears throat> and I think one reason they settled on these is they have a lifetime warranty. And uh, they're also really good binoculars. They cost a little bit more, but uh, uh, they're for a library and they send them out with a, a bird brochure and a, a night sky brochure. So that's a really good program. So I'm going to change over and we're going to start talking about winter skies now. Let's see. <clears throat> the winter sky is the brightest time of the year. You've got more bright stars in the winter skies than you have any other time of the year. Uh, we're going to be talking about, start out with the winter circle or the winter hexagon. It's called both. It has eight first magnitude stars and 11 of the 26 brightest stars. So um, winter definitely is the brightest time of the year when you're, when you're talking about starlight. But don't go out and look at the stars yet. Uh, it, it's cold. Does, if it's cold and, and it doesn't need to be clear or the moon's up, at your leisure, do a little map memory and memorization first. First time you go out, then you'll be tracing out constellations, naming bright stars, and finding deep sky objects with your binoculars. And um, a lot of times people walk out with a little star map and try to learn it outside. It's a lot easier to learn inside. And even, uh, do, you know, you've, you recognize a lot of these names. I'm sure you recognize or Orion, Tar and uh, then Taurus and Gemini. Uh, they are, uh, of course, they're, they're members of the Zodiac. And uh, then Canis Major and Canis Minor and Auriga make up the constellations in the winter hexagon. And you recognize some of these stars, too. You've probably heard of the movie Betelgeuse. Um, Rigel and Aldebaran were uh, two of Ben-Hur's horses and, and, uh, and Ben-Hur, the other two were Altair and Antares and they're in the summer sky. Then uh, Sirius, I don't know if you watched Harry Potter, you heard Sirius Black. Uh, Castor and Pollux uh, were the navigators of the uh, ship Argo uh, and Jason and the Argonauts. So anyway, you've, you've probably heard a lot of these, and so it won't be too hard to, to memorize them, learn to spell them, and learn to, learn to pronounce them, and it'll make your outing at the, under the stars more enjoyable. But anyway, let's, let's go to the uh, a chart of the uh, winter hexagon. Um, and the, something that really pops out at you when you go out tonight or, or in the wintertime is Orion. It'll, it'll, uh, it's got a, a lot of really bright stars in it. Uh, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and then the three belt stars are just fascinating. Um, they're all really bright first mag uh, second magnitude stars. And then these are two first magnitude stars. 
and magnitude is, is, is the brightness. The dimmest stars we can see is six magnitude. And then uh, Sirius is the only star that's minus one magnitude. And so it's, it's in this too. But you start with Orion, and, and if, you, if you go out before dark, uh, before it gets totally dark and start watching the stars pop out, the first ones you'll see are, are probably these three right here, Rigel, Betelgeuse, and Sirius. And it won't be too long before you're seeing the, uh, the, the belt, Orion's belt. Um, so from Orion's belt, you, you can see that uh, trace back to the left and, and to the brightest star, and it's pretty easy to find. It's just uh, uh, east of Orion, east of or going, following Orion's belt. And if you follow it west, you find another bright, it's not, not as, as bright, but it is a first magnitude star. Aldebaran and Taurus the bull. Uh, so now you've located three, uh, a constellation and, and two bright stars. It's pretty easy then to trace out the, the constellation of Taurus the bull. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. And, uh, and also uh, Canis Minor, Major. But anyway, from uh, uh, above Orion, if you go straight above Orion, you'll see another pair of stars and that's Castor and Pollux and Gemini. Uh, and then uh, if you go above Aldebaran, you'll see another really bright star. This is like, I think Capella's the sixth brightest star and uh, it's in Auriga. And then if you go above Sirius, you'll find the eighth brightest star, which is Procyon in Canis Minor. Once you get become familiar with these with these stars and star names, it's really easy to start locating your constellations and, uh, and tracing out your constellations. And this is something that I enjoyed when I was first learning is a star chart showing the brightest stars. And I, you know, I, I made an effort to learn them and, and see all the bright, the brightest stars I could see. Of course, some of them are in the, are in the Southern hemisphere, like Canopus and Alpha Centauri but uh, most of them are in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, let's start with Orion. <clears throat> and Orion, uh, if you're in dark skies, you can see, uh, you can trace out Orion's uh, shield and his head. He's got, for such a big, uh, strong warrior and all that, he's got a little bitty head. And then uh, his club held up above his uh, shoulder there. Uh, and also his sword, and his sword it, with binoculars is pretty spectacular. Uh, it's uh, it's there's quite a few stars in it, as are as are in the uh, uh, the the belt area. But uh, right in the middle of the sword is M42, which is the Great Orion Nebula, and it's it's really nice through a pair, a pair of binoculars. And here is the whole sword. You can see all the stars in the sword. There's a lot of a double stars uh, and pairs of stars. And uh, I tried to find a view that was kind of like you'd see in binoculars. <clears throat> M78 is a little dimmer. It's something you need in dark skies and, and uh, it's not one I put on the list to see right now. But two good binocular areas are, uh, are the belt and the, and the sword. But also, um, all, Betelgeuse is a red star. These stars in this area, uh, especially the belt star, the middle belt star is the bluest star. All these other stars are blue stars. And the bluest one is the middle star in the belt. So uh, you, can let, you, you can see them naked eye, but it's really nice through binoculars too to look at co star colors through binoculars. Taurus bull, we, we followed it right. It's got uh, and Aldebaran is also a red star. It's a little bit dimmer than uh, Betelgeuse, but it's, a, it's also a red star. And it's in a, a cluster named the Hyades. And uh, you can see it over here. It's, it's really a, a beautiful cluster. It's a, a V-shaped. Uh, with the naked eye, it's V-shaped. And uh, you can see that it's got some neat, nice star colors in it. Uh, but the most spectacular cluster in it is uh, in Taurus is, is the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And that's uh, 
uh, this this constellation up here at the top, I mean this uh, cluster at the top, uh, and it's also uh, uh, I mean it's it's Orion and the Pleiades are are in every civilization and and they're they're different things to different people, <laughs> different different societies down through history. So so uh, anyway, they're definitely nice through binoculars. Um, this star here, Elnath, is uh, is a um, one of the few stars that is in two constellations. It's it's one of the horns of the bull, Taurus the bull, and you can see the horns here. And it's also part of the Pentagon of Auriga. Uh, and Auriga is a is a a bright constellation uh, that has uh, it looks like I'm missing a star there. But uh, there is a, a bright, star, pretty bright star there, so it, it makes a really nice pentagon. Uh, Capella is a yellow star, like I said, it's the sixth brightest star, and you can sweep across it and find these three nice clusters. And then here's these three clusters here: M36, M37, and M38. Uh, and Capella is known as the goat star, and these are the goat's kids, right here. And one of those stars is one of the biggest stars. Uh, I think it's Epsilon Auriga. I uh, forget, I did, I, I did some observing of it one time. Okay, the next constellation we're going to is Gemini, Gemini the Twins. And I've got it drawn here like H.A. Uh, Ray redrew, drew a lot of constellations back about, uh, he's the one that uh, about 70 years ago. And uh, what I, but, but what I, the way I normally look at it is a, as a rectangle with these four stars right here. And off the bottom uh, of this side of the rectangle you, is real easy to find a real bright open cluster there with binoculars, M35. <clears throat> Next, I've got a Canis Major and Canis Minor together. And Canis Major is a very bright constellation. Adhera is like the 25th brightest star, and Sirius is the brightest star. And there's a nice cluster, uh, M41, near the heart of the dog here, uh, um, open cluster. Uh, there's a picture of it, but it's real easy in binoculars. One of the best ways to find it is with binoculars. For science, Canis Minor is a very small constellation with just two stars. Um, but uh, uh, it, for Scion is the eighth brightest star. And uh, uh, I don't remember, I think it's, it's a, another yellowish star. Uh, Sirius is a blue white star. <clears throat> so just back to showing the uh, summer triangle, once you find the objects that I've talked about, and, and I've got a list of them for you if you wanna print it out, but there's other objects here that are easy in binoculars. Uh, these uh, Monoceros in the area between uh, Procyon, Sirius, and Betelgeuse is a very dim constellation, but it's got some very nice uh, binocular objects in it, and I've got those shown here on the chart. And with binoculars, it's pretty easy to, to find Betelgeuse and then go, go, then find your way to the sweep in the sky, you can find these pretty easy. M46 and M47 are very bright uh, clusters. I don't remember, I think M93 is pretty good in binoculars too. Anyway, you can see the summer hexagon here and this chart is in a, there's a handout uh, that goes along with this. You can print out if you want to and this chart is in that, in that printout. Now let's turn to uh, the Northern sky. Um, uh, circumpolar, there's a circumpolar chart also in it. And the only thing in this that I, I wanna show you is Cassiopeia is the W or M shaped in the, uh, in the Northwest. And between it and Perseus, which is a bright constellation right above it is this, is the double cluster. Is a really, really pretty, uh, uh, cluster in binoculars or a small telescope. And here's a, a little blow up of it showing, showing where it is, almost right between those two constellations. And there, there's a, a little picture of it there. 
another thing is uh, up off of Gemini is a, a, a very bright open cluster. And uh, if you can see it, just take the Castor and Pollux and go to the east and find, uh, and you'll see a fuzzy spot probably as much as you do these two stars. These are the two brighter stars, but the Priesipi means the manger and the Acellus australis is the southern donkey and the Acellus borealis is the northern donkey. So that's, I thought that was pretty neat. And another object is, uh, <clears throat> is the head of Hydra right down below it. And you can see it, they're all right here in this area with Pollux, Castor and Procyon. And there's a checklist in the handout that, that you can uh, just check off some of these things we've talked about and start learning the skies. And that's it. Okay, well, thanks, Rocky. Uh, yeah. So we have, um, if, if you want to stop sharing, I guess, if you could. There you go, it's great. So we have um, put on to Zoom and to Facebook um, the PDF that we talked about. I think it should be able to download that. If not, let us know and we'll make sure and repost that again. But that's a good reference. Um, so do we have, if there's any questions, I'm not seeing questions out there yet in our Q&A and our focus area, but uh, yeah, we're getting some uh, comments, great presentation. And it said, one person says, can you see Andromeda galaxy in binoculars? You want to answer that? Yes, yes. And um, uh, right now you can, uh, and they'll be up for about another, uh, probably three or four weeks, but they'll be low in the wet, low in the Northwest. And, uh, uh, and I know that because I've done the Messier Marathon before, and and it's an object I missed in in mid March. I could I couldn't see it; it's too far gone. So if you want to see it with binoculars, right now is still a good time to see it. Right after dark, uh, when it gets good and dark, go out and um, find the Great Square, uh, and it may be partially down, um, but uh, you can definitely see it. Okay. So we have a viewer on uh, Zoom here. He says, I live in Virginia. Are my skies southern? And what are the boundaries, please? I, I think in Virginia, you can see everything we talked about now, um, in, including uh, Sirius is pretty low, but uh, it's the lowest thing, lowest one in there. But Virginia is not that, I'm in Arkansas, and Virginia is not that far north. I thought, what are you, about 38? or 40, yeah, 40 degrees. I, I suspect that he's referring to the part where you were talking about some some items are in the southern skies. So I don't think you'd be able to see the southern oh, sky. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I said, words, so I'm, at, I'm at the southern sky from the northern hemisphere. Yeah, right. So, what yeah, I meant. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think he'd be able to see, uh, he'd, be, he'd certainly be able to see a few things, but you'd have to go down to Australia or some other places to be able to see some of the, the other. Yeah, but every, everything I talked about, he should be able to see. All right, awesome, cool. Uh, and he says, what are the boundaries, please? Is that, I, I guess he's referring to, I'm not sure what he's referring to there. So, well, but whatever declination you are, um, you can see down to, <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, at, at 90 degrees minus that. Yeah. So Thank I'm, you. uh, I'm getting a question here about the handouts. I'm putting those out there right now into the, uh, handout. Uh, I think I just posted that to everybody on Zoom, and I believe that's on Facebook as well. If you cannot get that, let us know, and it should be able, you should be able to get that now. So that's a little PDF you should be able to load directly from our, our website. Um, I will say that when I go out, uh, you know, I started, and I took the very typical track of most people that want to get into astronomy. I had to have a telescope, and I went out and bought a telescope. I skipped right over binoculars. And then I realized that I didn't have any clue where anything was in the sky. And so the yeah, person got it there. And so what I actually ended up doing is I put my telescope away and I got binoculars out. And I started learning where the constellations were. And once you learn those, then you could find stuff around that to look at. Double stars, galaxies, clusters. And that made it a lot more fun. Uh, that's at least for me. And I, and I will say that I took a librarian out recently. And they had not really used uh, eight by 42 binoculars. And they looked at the seven sisters, the Pleiades, and they were blown away. Like, wow, that is really, really pretty. It is just so amazing, really. All right, so do we have any other questions from the audience, either on Zoom or Facebook? Uh, I'm not seeing too many questions here. We appreciate everybody's attention tonight. 
Yeah, I don't see anything on Facebook. Uh, okay, cool. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up, guys. Uh, Rocky, you did a great job. Uh, and again, just to explain, we are going to post this. Uh, well, I do have one question here. Being 60 year olds, does a two by 100 open up any new items that a nine by 63 wouldn't? A two by 100, so I guess that's two. Um, two magnifications, 100. Boy, that's a lot of aperture there. I'm sorry, 20 by 100. Okay, 20. By oh, 100. 20 by 100. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you have to you have to have stabilizations for that. If um, you're better off starting out, I'm not saying don't get them, but, but you <laughs> you might want to get a pair of eight by forty twos or something like that with them. At sixty years old, eight by forty two is what you need. Well, That's those a fantastic uh, pair of binoculars. Yeah, so eight by sixty threes are um, you know that would be a seven millimeter. So uh, I've never used them, but they're going to be heavier and harder to hand hold than like 10 by 50s would be. 10 by 50s would be a good, better, I think, for you than uh, 9 by 63s. Yeah, 100 millimeter is, our library telescope is a 114, so you can imagine how big that is. So yeah. that means that, wow, that, that is going to be a probably a fairly heavy set. And when I go outside, uh, you cannot get any kind of hand holding to 20 by 100 no way can you get a star right. they put it's like you're averaging it's like the stars flipping around so much so yeah yeah you have to you have to have a amount to if you're going to use 20 by 80s or 20 by 25 by 100s or 20 by 80s yeah so we we have somebody here asking about uh can it be added to the email list um i think if you go to the facebook um that's our, our website we actually have these events on our calendar on our website uh, so we do it at the same time every month, this particular uh, Wednesday. So if you just look for that and look for, we got next events already on the calendar for the Facebook, I'm sorry, for the Facebook as well as for the Library Telescope. So just go out and look at the homepage, the Library Telescope, and there's an events page and you can actually sign up. You can do either Zoom or Facebook, either one. Uh, and it says here, seven, seven millimeters is probably too large to fit into the eye pupil of the 60 year old. I don't know. I, I I'm 60. I'm actually going on 70 or seven millimeters. Uh, is, is okay. Yeah, it's probably fine. So it's losing a little light. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, yeah, that, I've never used a pair of nine by 63s. I I've kind of always wanted a pair of eight by 56s, but never have gotten one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh. I will say that when you get you know the binoculars, you're getting stereo viewing. That's kind of cool. I've actually done that with telescopes, yeah. where you get telescope that stereo viewing is really cool. It's a whole another depth level. Which yeah, the important nice. thing is not is is to get out and use them, right? That, that's right. That's, that's, that's <laughs> Even that's whether exactly they're right. That's exactly right. Or Ten by fifties or whatever they are. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, Rocky, thanks for a lot for this great presentation, and Tom, thanks for helping me in the background there. Um, again, this will be posted onto our Facebook, onto our YouTube account somewhere tomorrow, and of course, uh, it's on Facebook Live right now. As soon as we shut up, uh, you'll be able to go back and play that again. I think in just a matter of a few minutes. Uh, so join us next month on March 16th. Uh, we're going to be focusing on a library, a particular library that launched a program in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, we're going to hear what the librarians have to say about it, how they promoted it, and uh, how successful it's been. It's, and we, and if, we, if you guys have suggestions for programs, let us know through Facebook or whatever else, and we'll be happy to try to accommodate those. So everyone, thanks. Good night. Um, and once again, Rocky and Tom, thanks a lot for your great program tonight. Thank you. Well, mm -hmm.